Hey, how's it going? Scott here from SBL, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most legendary bass players of all time, the amazing James Jameson. Now, most of you will be probably familiar with Jameson's work, you know, like he recorded with guys, he recorded with everybody, like Stevie Wonder, Martha and the Vandellas, Marvin Gaye, Edwin Starr, Jackie Wilson, The Four Tops, The Supremes, The Temptations, Smokey Robinson, and Diana Ross, and a ton of other people. Now, if you listen to tracks such as like My Girl, uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine, You Can't Be Love, Science of Delivered, Papa Words of Rolling Stone, Tears of a Clown, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, all of that was James Jameson and obviously the session band, The Funk Brothers. In fact, it is claimed that The Funk Brothers have played on more hit records, in fact, more number one hits than The Beatles, Elvis Presley, The Rolling Stones, The Beach Boys combined. But what was it about James Jameson that ended up making him legendary? What was it about his bass lines and his bass line construction that made record companies postponed recording dates until they could get him on it because they believed that his bass lines had a really high contribu contributing factor to that record being a hit, okay? If you think about it, it's a really unique thing to happen. First and foremost, I think that we need to consider that James Jameson was a piano player when he was a kid and he really understood chord structure and we can hear that in his bass lines. He was a piano player but secondly, he was a jazz player. He'd been playing in his jazz high school band. He'd been playing with jazz stars around Detroit on the upright bass. And then he began to get those skills and apply them to the electric bass. And for me, he was one of the first guys that did that. And it is really easy to overlook how amazing he was at baseline construction and outlining the chords. He had complete mastery of it. In fact, we're going to take the first eight bars of For Once In My Life that was recorded in 1968 by Stevie Wonder, obviously Jameson on bass. We're going to break down the first eight bars of the bass line and I'm going to point out some things that were not only goes missed, but every time I see somebody playing at a gig or playing it on YouTube, they don't get these specific things because it's everything's in the cracks, right? If you're a Jameson nerd, if you're into bass lines and wanting to get your bass line creation to the next level, stick around because this is going to be super interesting for you. So just in those first eight bars, there is a massive amount of stuff going on. And not only, you know, a massive amount of stuff going on, because yeah, it's really busy. And that was one of Jameson's things. He could play really busy, but provide this amazing foundation and just keep out of the way of everybody. Like there's not many bass players around that can do that. And I think that that is one of the um, things that the labels must have picked up on is that, hey, we've got this guy and he can play these crazy, busy and melodic phrases underneath the track that almost become like a second melody and not get in the way of any, anybody. Like doing that is really, really, it's a really talented thing to do. It's really hard to do it. If you take just the first measure or the first two measures, okay, I'm going to play it slowly for you so you can check it out. Okay, now this is just like an F major moving to a G minor with, a, uh, with an F sharp diminished in the middle. But he's not playing like roots and fifths. What he's doing is he's going. Okay, so he plays root, third, sixth, third, fifth. And that becomes like, and he uses open strings a lot. He was an upright bass player and upright bass players use open strings all of the time to check their intonation because the open string never changes, right? They're playing. You know, they use those open strings all the time. Jameson used the same thing in his lines. Okay, so just here. Now, there's a ton of open strings going on. Um, third, six, third, fifth and then to the root root fifth third fifth he'll have been seeing that 
F sharp as a D7, let's not even go there. Now, if we move on to measure three, where it gets to the G minor, okay, it goes like this. Okay, so that's measure three again. This is a great example of linking up your chord tones using chromaticism, okay? So he's got this. And he plays up to that D, up to the fifth. Actually, he plays it as an open D. Up to the G, using these chromatic runs. And then from that F, down to the D again. And then when he hits that D, again he's using D, fifth, third, fifth of that D7. Again, he's doing an, just an outstanding job of outlining the chords, but doing it in a way that is like super ninja. Now in the next two bars, we've got, that's, that's kind of simple, you know, root. Just on that G minor. This next bar, again, there's like this super ninja thing that he does. And this is straight, this is directly from jazz language. That's how a jazz player would play it. And it's over 2 5 1, G minor to C7. And he's playing root, minor third, major third fifth and then hits that D so he's, he's, he's dropping that uh, dropping the major third in there as a chromatic note but he's not going he's actually jumping he's bouncing up to that that D and then coming back down and resolving on that C like this is just out and out jazz language but in a pop scenario That takes us to the next bar, and it's really just, he's using root third, five, six, and octave, right? It's like, it's like a pentatonic based vibe, but Jameson won't have been thinking about pentatonics. He really will have been thinking about chord tones, because they'll have come directly from um, that jazz upright background. Then we've got... Now, that last part, that last measure there, like this, that, like. What can I say? There was nobody doing this. <laughs> there was no bass players doing this at that time, okay? So we go root, root, third, six, sharp 11, five, or sharp four, five. Two, three, four. It's hard to get the feel, and one thing I really want to point out again is that Jameson's, the use of open strings really made him, like it gave him that feel. It's a really big thing when it comes to getting that feel. You've got to be using the open strings, otherwise you're not going to get the bounce. Now to give you a visual representation of how Jameson was doing this, like the, from a harmonic perspective and from a rhythmical perspective, so you can see both of those elements linking together and how complex this really is, because it can be lost when you watch me do it. It can be like, yeah, it looks okay. But when you see a visual score of this going on, it might highlight it a lot better for you. So I've grabbed a little 20 second um, snippet from a great video that Jack Stratton from Wolfpack has released on YouTube. To watch the full thing, I'll put it in the uh, I'll put it in the comments so you can click and go through. Not the comments, the description. You can click and go through there and check out the full thing. It'll show you exactly what I'm trying to encapsulate here: the the complexity of his rhythmical um, focus and also his harmonic side as well. So check this out.
Mm. Amazing, right? And I think like when you see that visual score, it really, or for me, I was like, holy crap, this bass line is just genius. And how many times have you heard that song? Probably a ton of times. You've not even realized how complex that bass line is. So again, I've hooked up the original of that graphic score down below by Jack. If you want to go check it out, it's really, really cool. Now, before you go though, I want to talk about Jameson's gear. Uh, just give you an outline of that and also his technique as well because there was a few things about his technique two things about his technique that you really need to know first of all is that he used one finger on his plucking hand okay nicknamed the hook pretty cool uh you can give it a go if you want it's really really hard to play like a bass line such as you know the one that we've been working on today with one finger but you can give it a go um, I've tried it, I can't do it. Or I can do it, but it's like a sloppy job of it where like Jameson completely nails it. And he, you know, he used one finger pick. He was an upright guy, right? He came from upright, those upright bass players, for the most part when they're playing walking bass lines, they're just playing with one finger. So he just got that, that technique and brought it over to the, uh, to the electric bass. The next thing about his, um, his technique, and I have mentioned this before, is that he uses a lot of open strings, okay? When, he can, he'll use an open string. So for instance, in one of the tracks that he plays on, he plays a chromatic run from B flat to A flat, D, 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 and every bass player, me included, would generally play that. But Jameson didn't, he played B flat, open A, A flat. Okay, and then on this part of the, of the bass line, Most people would play it like that. Jameson. Played the open D, then to the E flat. So they're the two real things that stick out for me about his, his uh, technique and how that influenced his sound. And in terms of gear, he used a P bass, um, like a lot of guys back then that was, you know, there was only a few basses available and the P bass was kind of king. So he used a P bass. He used foam underneath the bridge. I've got this little uh, contraption, which is pretty cool, but you can, you know, cut up a normal sponge and just shove that under the bridge. It's going to do exactly the same job. He used flat wounds um, on his bass. I think that's it for the bass. And then in terms of the amp, well, actually a lack of one, he actually went direct into a DI and then into the desk. It was an Acme DI that he used for all the Motown recordings. And when he did go on tour or did play live, he used an Ampeg B15. But for the most part, when you hear any James Jameson playing with all of those guys I mentioned earlier, it's all done direct into an Acme DI and then straight into the desk. As always guys, thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed this, leave a comment and, set, and you know a recommendation of who else you'd like me to do this kind of video on. If you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well and click your notifications on. And lastly, if you've not been to scottsbasslessons.com, which is my thing, it's an online bass school that I run for bass players like you, do so. Just go straight over there and check it out. It's essentially a completely new opportunity for you, you know, a bass player to study with some of the best bass educators on the planet, including myself. Go check it out. We've got a huge course library. We do live streams all the time. So there's like interactive Q and A's. We've got interviews with some of the best bass players on the, uh, on the planet and tons more as well. And on top of that, we've actually got a 14 day free trial running right now as well. So you can go and check it out, grab the 14 day free trial, give it a test drive and see if it's for you. And if it isn't, you can cancel it at any time. I will put the link down below for that. As always guys, take it easy and I'll see you in the shed.